This is a technique that the best people in the world want to know how to do. Nobody's actually shown how to do this yet, mainly because I came up with how to do it, you know? It's very rare that we have a project at Chef Steps that even I'm a little intimidated to tackle. This is some medieval mastery at place here. It's a pate and croute, zillion ingredients, even more steps, but we brought in a master to show you how. Kevin Smith, who's got Beast and Cleaver here in Seattle. He's been competing around the world. Third last year for the pate and croute. It's amazing. Very simply, pate en croute is a pate inside of pastry. That's it at its most simplest form. Um, this is that, only we've elevated it more. The technical things that I'm looking for are going to be a crisp pastry on the top and on the bottom, a tiny bit of chew down the outside, beautiful mosaic of a different type of meat running through it and a lovely, clear, reduced aspect that's filled with flavor. Let's do it. Okay, so today I'm gonna to start working on the fast or a classic pate en croute. Here we've got beautiful pork liver. Over here we have our pork belly, which has been diced up. This is gonna go into the fast after it's mixed and it's gonna create a lovely mosaic. Okay, so we've just ground it. It's um, looking just like ground meat at this stage, you know. It's not really tacky at the moment. We're gonna get a real tackiness going on. Into this pate, we're gonna add salt and pink salt too. I'm gonna give this a good mix. Once we go through the grinder again, you'll start to see the texture change massively in this. So in with my white pepper, allspice, mace, black pepper, a little chili flake, fresh thyme. I'm gonna put this through the grinder too. Lots of fresh garlic, and we're gonna start to mix again. Notice that I haven't added the um, other stuff in yet. This is the pork belly and the back fat and our prunes. We're not gonna add those in because we don't want to grind those. We wanna create a mosaic effect. That's the aim. And this is almost where I wanna be, but I wanna go through the grinder again. I and mean, this is really going to take it to the next stage of emulsification of meat here, which is really important for a good pate. Now, I wouldn't do this with every type of pate, but for this type of one where we're going for a mosaic effect, it's uh, very important. Our finished pate en croute should not have any air gaps in it. Kind of a no-no for pate en croute. Okay, so this is where it starts to change and get really exciting and the flavors are gonna to start to be developed right here. So I've got beautiful prunes here. They've been steeped in Calvados and creme de mure overnight, like a blackberry liqueur. I'm just gonna take these, this juice from here and pour this in. I'm gonna save the prunes because they're gonna go in as part of the inlay and the mosaic pattern at the end. So they're gonna live over here. And now we've got our pork belly, again, uncooked. Nothing's been done to it, just chopped up. This is gonna be added in to our pate fast base over here. And the same thing over here, we've got beautiful back fat, which has been blanched once in salted water. You can see it's all different shapes, different textures. I'm not trying to get perfect dice on that. We want to have mosaic going through here. So in with all of this, notice that there's a lot of fat in here too. Over here, pistachios, beautiful, adds texture, adds flavor. I have one egg going straight in. And then this will basically be our fast done. Important to note is here, it's quite wet. This is what I want. We don't want a dry pâté. We're not going for country style pâté. We're not going for pâté rustique. We're going for a smooth fast that has got lots of texture going through it. And as you can see in here, it's starting to come together. And from here, all I'm gonna do is wrap this up and leave it to sit for at least three days. Five days is gonna give you an insane amount of um, flavor coming off of this. The rest of the stuff will be assembled as we go into the pate. Now I'm gonna make the boudinoir. Boudinoir is like a classic French blood sausage. Uh, this is about 80% classic and a little bit of the stuff that I'm changing for how it's made and how it's gonna be finished. So. Uh, very easy to make, just like most sausages or pate bases, you just simply combine your uh, meat and salt into a bowl, going in. Over here I've got pig's blood, which is a vital part of uh, boudinoir. 
it wouldn't be Boudin Noir without pig's blood. So going in over here, just literally all you need to do is combine everything and work it well. Got some cream, black pepper, lots of garlic, tiny amount of shallot. Normally at the shop, this is not really common in uh, pate making to be doing this. So <laughs> you can see this like beautiful red color. I'm trying to get it to the stage where it's going to become tacky and stick to my hand. So that took less than a minute. And this is the texture that I want for this. Again, this is not the most traditional boudin noir, but it's what works for me and what I want in this particular pate. I'm gonna take this and add it to this sheet tray over here. Not very traditional again. And I'm gonna put this on here, push it down so it's nice and thin. And I'm gonna create a nice long strip on here. This is gonna get frozen and go into the pate as a long cylinder strip that goes right down the middle. This is it. Just gonna keep it on this long strip like this and we'll cut it right down the middle, ready for the final pate on croup. Aspic, one of the most time consuming things in the kitchen to make, but I'm gonna explain how we at the shop make it and then I'll give you a little tip on how to make it at home, which will speed up your process from 48 hours to 10 minutes. We've got pig's feet over here filled with collagen. Massive, massive amounts of collagen in pig's feet. Beef bones over here. This is the knuckle, which basically is the top of the femur bone. We wanna roast this and get it all crispy and burnt. And then we wanna put these in a pot. At a shop, we have a pot this big, filled up to the top with 12, 20, 30 pig's feet, depending on how much we're making. Bring it up to a boil. All of the scum, the impurities are gonna to come to the top. We'll skim all of that stuff off and then we'll cook it for 48 hours to slowly extract all of the collagen and natural gelatins in the bones. And not much else going on other than low, slow cooking. Uh, it will get strained and chilled. And the next day we'll have a pot of clear, unflavorful gelatin that really is one of the best products you can get for just about any use in the kitchen from sauce making to pâtés. We use it for everything. Um, the amount of collagen you can get from pig's feet is insane. So after we have got that massive vat of jelly, we want to take uh, red wine and port and reduce them down with some lovely aromats over here. For me, I like cinnamon and star anise, black pepper, bay. You can be as creative as you want with that. Also rosemary and stems of, of herbs are fantastic. You don't want to be throwing in big batches of fresh parsley. It's just going to disintegrate and you won't notice it in the end. So big reduction of wine and port will come down to its thick. That will then get added back into the aspic and then we'll start cooking it down again. So we're coming down from this much to this much to this much. And by the end of it, it's uh, still not been seasoned. You end up with something that looks like this, which is essentially pure collagen. Amazing for, <laughs> for your health as well. It's really great for skin and all of the uh, digestive system. Fantastic to eat. I'll eat it just like that sometimes. The reason we're doing this is we want to be able to pour this into our pâté en croûte. It has to have a high collagen content because the pâté en croûte is served at room temperature. If you don't have a high collagen content, when you cut into the pâté, your aspic or sauce, whatever you pour in, is gonna be just pouring out all over the plate and you've wasted a lot of time. So this is the final product of how we get there. So for, for the home cooks making this, uh, easiest way to do it is to just go and get some good beef stock, chicken stock, pork stock, flavor it, bring it to a nice rolling boil for a minute or two, add all of your aromats in there and just leave it steep in a separate pot. Just reduce a little wine and port to a little syrup, add it in. On the side, you've got some sheets of gelatin or powdered gelatin, which have been steeped in cold water. And then you're gonna whisk those in and make sure that they're fully um, emulsified into the stock. What will happen then is you'll chill it overnight and you'll end up with a product similar to this but you've saved yourself 48 hours at least. We're gonna start with butter going in here. Tallow is gonna give you a much uh, crispier pastry. All I'm trying to do at this stage is make sure the butter and the tallow have emulsified into one. Already we have everything at room temperature, so it should mix nice and easily, just like so. So from here, 
we're just gonna take our egg yolks. This is the stage when you think you've messed it up because it starts to break and you're like, oh no, it's broke. It's meant to do that, so don't worry about that. And I just wanna make sure now that all of the butter and the tallow and the yolks have combined. You can see it's not combined here. So that's why we wanna take a spatula and make sure that we get everything at the bottom of the bowl. So just another 10, 15 seconds and we'll be right where we wanna be. So we don't wanna over whip it. We don't wanna separate the milk solids or anything like that. This is good. So done here. Basically looks like a compound butter with egg yolks in it. This is what we're looking for for this particular pastry. So next stage, we're going to add our corn flour into here. Corn flour, corn starch, same thing. We wanna add it in two to three batches. This is gonna soften the dough so that it allows us to roll it out to quite a big sheet. So just in, turn it down. I'm just gonna go in with the rest here. While this is mixing, put my salt into the flour and just gonna mix this in. This is gonna go in in about two to three batches. Don't have it on super high because you'll have a room full of flour. A bread crummy stage here now. Again, we're not looking for flaky pastry. We want development of gluten, but not to the stage of a bread or a brioche. I'm gonna turn it up just a touch. This is looking exactly like what I want it to look like here. So we talk about breadcrumbs when making pastry. This is a, a breadcrumb stage here. I'm gonna turn the mixer on nice and slow, and we're just gonna add our cold water into here, and it's gonna come together and form our pastry. This is where the gluten development is still happening here now. Again, this is where we don't want to make brioche. We want gluten development, but not over. So a few seconds here. This is exactly what we're looking for here. Look at the, the difference in this pastry to a lot of those. It's dark yellow from the high yolk content. Very, very high fat content in this pastry too. Um, and this is exactly what we want. The mixers are going to do a great job, but hands are always going to be better. So just to bring this together just a touch, and then this guy's gonna go onto here and we're gonna push it down. This is gonna make our rolling out of the dough a lot easier. And we always wanna keep pastry cold when we're working with it. Now this is coming together here. This is the finished pastry. Wrap it, chill it, get ready to use it. Okay, so the pastry we just made, pastry that I made a couple of days ago. And one thing to notice is how firm this one is. This is how it re-solidifies. We cannot work with this dough at the moment. It's way too soft. And this one is exactly where we want it to be. Rolling out the dough. I want to be cautious with the amount of flour we add here because it will change the structure of the pastry if we're adding too much. My aim here is to roll this pastry out so it's big enough for my pate mold because if you have a lid, you won't get a continuous seamless pattern. So the only way to do that is to skip the lid step. You can see the way the pastry is becoming very, very smooth now. Putting it on here. Whenever I'm working with pastry, I'm always telling whoever it is to be very gentle with it and use the back of your hands. Don't use your fingers. Don't be sticking your thumbs in. We wanna be using the back of our hands almost as if we're rolling out pasta. Now, as I'm getting here and the pastry's coming, it's warming up, so hand down, flick it onto the back and turn it. As it gets bigger, that's gonna be an important step with working with pastry. Are we gonna do that again, Kevin? Yeah, I'm gonna do it about 10 times. And at this stage, I want to grab my pate mold down here, start visualizing how big I need it to be. What I'm aiming for is one, two, three, four, and about half of one to play with because we're going to have a slight dome on this pate. So the length of this pastry needs to be one, two, three, four times the sides of these. So now very close to getting where I want to be. Notice the thickness of the pastry. So over, lift up, gently down. I'm gonna grab my mold again here and start to measure. I'm gonna take a blunt pastry knife and I'm gonna cut over here to start to square the edges off. 
now it's starting to look like something I can work with. I can see where I'm going with it from here. This is going to be used again. So how far along are we with width? One, two, three, four. So I need to go a little bit thinner. So I need to be about here. So just a little bit more rolling. One more time. This should be where we need to be now. I'm also measuring the distance of this. So from here to here. So I'm gonna do one more count. One, two, three, four, and a little bit to play with. From here, I'm gonna make a mark here and here, and then gonna put this down here, and I'm gonna match here and here. It doesn't matter if you're a tiny bit off here. It's better to be over than under. It fits pretty much exactly where we want it to be. One, two, three, four, and a little bit to play with. This needs to chill in the refrigerator now for 10 to 15 minutes, just so it becomes cold enough to add the twill paste. Very important to have it on parchment. Otherwise, when we get to the twill paste, you won't be able to pick it up. So a uh, little tip there. From here, this is gonna go into the refrigerator to chill down. I have these excess pieces here. Regardless of how we try and assemble the pate, the pattern is gonna get a little bit messed up. The only way to make that uh, disappear is to, is to hide it with something decorative. So I think a little braid is fantastic. So outside in is the key to these guys. We are little braid here should be as long as this which it is it's also quite flexible so we can pull it if needed this will go into the sheet tray and cool down in the fridge in a minute this excess piece of dough i'm going to roll these pieces together and what i'm looking for here is i'm trying to make these two end pieces here when we actually assemble it you'll see that if you're going to get a leak anywhere it will be in the bottom corners so having a slightly thicker pastry going in is always going to be beneficial. To create a piece that just looks like this with room to play, it needs to be as high as this <clears throat> with a little excess. So I'm going to cut it right here. Again, just measuring. And these two pieces will essentially sit in here and become our ends. So they're there. So one last little rollout with this. So chimney's not essential. It's just another little thing that I like to add to the finished pate. As, the as it cooks and the steam is escaping, the meat is gonna wanna souffle up. And if there's no chimneys, it's just gonna crack and break the pastry. I like to dip them in flour, help them stop them sticking. And out, two, three, four, five, one in case we mess it up. Creating our chimneys, creating our decorative patterns, which I love, pop them out. So that is the, all of the pastry rolled out now. There's hardly any waste, which is great. So we got our finished pastry all rolled out here, our pate mold, our piece of pastry for the three sides, including the bottom and the lid. We have our two end pieces, our decorative pieces over here. These are gonna help for the chimney. We got a very small amount of waste, which is fantastic. And um, in the next uh, step, we'll just assemble all of this and put, add the twill paste to it, yeah? To start with the twill paste, we're just gonna basically whip room temperature butter, activated charcoal. It doesn't really taste of too much, but it's gonna give us a beautiful um, pattern. You can substitute this for beetroot powder, cacao, spinach powder. I'm gonna turn it down low because it is gonna potentially spread up in the air. I don't really normally wear gloves apart from when I work with activated charcoal. You can see the way it's coming up. It's totally fine. I'm gonna stop a sec, just open it up. Just get my hands in here. So at a moment, it's not all combined and that's totally fine. It's not gonna be combined until all the ingredients are added. Very messy. I'm gonna go in with my egg whites now and everything's gonna to start to come together. So turn up the speed. Kind of looks like a weird black slime and uh, it is, that's okay. I'm not trying to like make this into a delicious thing here. This is clearly just for decoration. So I'm gonna turn it down. And I'm going to add my flour. 
Again, uh, using bread flour here, because I want to develop gluten so it's more spreadable. We'll turn it up. By doing this, when we go to the next stage, which is spreading this across the pastry, it's going to make my life a lot easier. If it's grainy, it's, it's going to get stuck to the mold. This is basically done at this stage. I want to take it off, scrape it out onto a little sheet tray. I suggest not putting this on your table because it will make anything it touches jet black. You can see here the texture. Development of gluten on here is evident, starting to drop. Perfect. Basically from here, this is done. All I will do is wrap this in plastic. This can live at room temperature while we're gonna work with it. It can also keep in the fridge for at least seven days. Don't freeze it, it'll break down and become grainy. So just make it like this, easy. So we are going to add our twill paste to our pastry with the use of one of these. One side is flat, one side has a slight grip on the back and that will sit on top of our pastry. This edge and this edge are just a little bit longer than this. This will give me room when I go to pick it up that I'm not putting my hands into the pattern over here. Got my twill paste, I'm wearing gloves, it's at room temperature. I've got a flexible spatula here. Pastry's cold, I wanna make sure it's cold. And I'm just gonna smear this in. And when it's room temp, it should go in nice and easy, just like it is now. It takes a few minutes. You want to make sure you work it in. Just take your time, get it across. I like to work it across the whole piece of pastry first. I have some water over here. Sometimes the twill paste will need an extra touch of water if it's too dry. You know, flowers sometimes react differently. This one is working exactly how I would like it, so it doesn't need any water on here. Uh, I'm trying to keep this clean as I can up here um, because it's where I'm going to pick it up when I go to, to use it. Not the end of the world if your fingers make it dirty. It is going to get cut off eventually, but it's good practice. It's good technique. I think right about where we want to be now. So Okay, so we've got our twill paste on. So from here now, we're gonna chill this down for about another 10 minutes and then we're gonna build the entire pate, put all of our decorative stuff on and um, we'll be ready to rock. Egg wash for our pate. Normally I would just use egg yolks to glaze the top of the pate, but because we're going that extra step and made a twill paste, if we just put straight egg yolks on it, it's gonna be too thick and it will start to peel the twill paste off and you won't end up with a very smooth looking decorative pattern. So a little trick that I've found out to do is just take an egg yolk and a little bit of cream, just mix it together. And this will give us a much lighter, easier wash that is thinner. What I'm looking for here is a thin egg wash, tiny bit more. And this will basically, when the first coat of this goes onto the pate with the twill paste, it will create a small glaze that will protect the twill paste underneath. When it chills for a few minutes, it solidifies over the top of it. Then you can come in with your egg yolk, which is dark yellow, and it's gonna make it look super cool. But you can't get to the second stage unless you do a, a much thinner egg wash. Ready to do our assembly now, we have Everything made, now's the part where we can get into it. Have our farce over here, the one that's been curing for three days, our prunes, our two different types of egg wash, our pastry, our mold, our frozen boudinoir, foie gras over here, cut into irregular sizes. I chunk it into pieces and freeze it because if it's too soft when it goes in, it's gonna leach all of its fat. So having it frozen with these two really helps the final texture and moisture content of the pate. So with that, this is probably the most tricky part is getting this off here. So I wanna go underneath and lift here and then back down. The reason I have not a paste on here is I'm gonna turn it over gently onto itself. Before I do that, I wanna make sure that this has had a really good spray in here. This will help the pate come out really easily. Take this, pick it up, drop it in gently, gently, gentle fingers here, pushing in, same on this side. My end pieces, I wanna take a little pastry brush and I want the egg yolk to be pushing in 
to connect with the pastry. Anywhere there's egg yolk, it's going to be glue. I'm feeling good. So now I'm just gonna go relatively quick and get all of our ingredients in here. Keep it pretty small. I'm putting maybe an inch in the bottom here. Pushing down, this is squaring the pastry off into the mold. Don't rush this stage. Then I wanna take this guy, which has been frozen, and plonk it right down in the middle. What happens is it's gonna shrink up here. So the really, really important part is the center of the pate here. We're gonna come back in now with a, another line of the farce. Then we're gonna add our foie gras and prunes. And knowing that we don't wanna build it up too high, because we'll create a huge dome. And when pâté on croûts have a dome, there's a, there's a risk of them breaking in terms of the pastry breaking. They're gonna be more stable if they're flat. So going in, trying to get into all these little gaps. And it is inevitable that you are gonna get air gaps at this stage. The really, really important thing is that when the aspic goes in, pour it in at the correct temperatures because it will seep its way through. It will find its way into where there's any air gap um, and it will, it will set in there. I'm gonna take some prunes here now. Nice little layer of prunes coming down, pushing them down. I like to have a continuous layer of prunes so that every bite, each person gets the same bite. And we're building up flavors here. It's really important to build flavors. So in here, pushing down, I'm gonna come in with a really small layer of farce here now. I'm working fast here because I don't want the pastry to become too soft. If it's too soft, there's a chance it can um, start to melt and break. And that's definitely not what we want. <laughs> all right, foie gras, last layer, poking it into the pate. I want it to run all the way along. I want everyone to get a piece of it. The chunks are frozen. If you don't have foie gras, you don't have to use foie gras, but it's a fantastic ingredient. You know, you can use chicken breast. You could just use all the farce. You could use duck breast, goose breast. There's just unlimited amounts of things you could put in these. So last little layer. So this is looking great. Just exactly the right amount that I need here. Okay, so last little step. I'm just gonna smooth it down gently. Then I'm gonna trim these edges and I'm gonna demonstrate how to do the seamless pate on the croup with no lid. And then this is gonna fold over onto the meat here. And this guy is going to fold over onto the meat here. This piece of pastry on this side here, I'm going to cut it. Uh, this is where the pattern is going to get messed. So I'm coming in maybe two inches down, just cutting along. I'm going to take my egg wash and I want to glue everything here now. So coming along, this is now going to disappear. It's going to fold over here. Gonna lose this piece. We're gonna gently push this down here, making sure that the egg is touching the egg. So this side is now done. I wanna take the other side and repeat the process. I'm not gonna try and egg wash this side. I wanna egg wash the inside of the clean pastry because there's no pattern on it. Again, thinking about glue, this piece is gonna stick to this piece. Okay, so over now, lifting, draping. And this is where I was telling about earlier that we're gonna have an intentional floor in the pattern. And that's where we're gonna hide this entire floor with our um, braid. So as you can see from here, this is looking exactly what I want it to look like. Need to do just a little trim in here, coming down edge. It's really important not to force the pastry. It will break. But what I'm doing is pulling back. Look, in close here, pulling the pastry back, gently pushing it down here. So you can see here, this is intentional. This is where our braid is going to go. And I'm going to egg wash that with um, the normal yolk here because I want a stronger glue on here. So my braid will live right here. And I'll move it around, I'll push it into the places where I want it to go, it's flexible. But you can see how this, <laughs> this hides our imperfections, you know? And uh, this was something that took me a while to figure out how to do. 
more egg if needed. Anywhere there's dry pastry, tuck it in. So from here, really happy with how this is looking. There's a couple of little spots there that are not perfect, but that's that's okay. So at this stage, looking looking pretty good. So while I'm here, I'm now gonna go ahead and um, cut my chimney holes out. And I'll do like two fingers from the end here. And then I'll cut a nice big hole. Holes are big. We want them to release steam, pop this out. And you can see underneath here, the second piece of pastry. That's making me happy because I, I have a good seam here. If, this, if there's not a second piece of pastry, you're still fine, but there's a chance that there's, um, you're, you're not gonna have as good of a seal. So again, roughly two fingers down here. I'm gonna take my chimneys and I'm gonna egg wash the vents and I'm gonna egg wash the bottoms of these. It's really important these are cold. From here, we'll just pick these up. I like to use the bottom of a knife just to be on the safe side. They're gonna live on top. Okay, so last little decorative pieces. These guys, one, two, three, four, five, we'll do four. And I'm gonna take my egg wash, pieces that don't have any activated charcoal on it at this stage. So um, just finishing up the egg washing of the parts of the pastry that have um, no charcoal on. And this is gonna go and chill for just a minute or two in the fridge. The reason I wanna do that is just so the egg yolk hardens. And um, when we go to put the egg wash on here, we're not making it dirty. So this is done. This is gonna go live in the fridge for a couple of minutes. Okay, so we have our thinner egg wash here. We're on with egg yolks and a little milk in it. In theory, what happens is this is thin, so it doesn't pull the charcoal as much. And as this cools, on the next wash, we'll be able to give everything the final egg wash. Gently blow, use whatever means you need to keep it clean and smooth. In. You can see if this was with just egg yolk, it would be pulling this off. So we're gonna do the very last part of the egg washing. This is a egg yolk, not the um, egg yolk with the milk in it. Take your time, enjoy when you do these things there. I lose myself when I make these. It's like a beautiful little place that I go to. Love it. All right, I'm gonna call that good. Very happy with this pate over here now. It's gonna chill out in the fridge for half an hour, hour. This is the finished one prior to cooking. It's all made. We're going to put it in the oven, cook it 410 degrees. We're going to check it in about nine to 10 minutes. <clears throat> then we're going to do a full rotation on it in the oven. Give it about another nine to 10 minutes. We're looking for it to be golden brown. There's going to be a key point of the butter starting to caramelize and you'll see it start to seep out of the edges. That can take anywhere from 20 to 26 minutes to happen. Uh, so we'll go and check it after 20 minutes on the second time. Then we'll add our chimneys to it. Then we will drop the temperature to 200 degrees and cook it to an internal temperature of 145 degrees with this particular pate. So we've got the oven set to 410. A sheet tray, it's gonna drop it in nice and carefully. I'm gonna put this hotel pan underneath just to catch any, any excess fat that drips out, saves cleaning the oven. So we're good to go, we have a timer on. Beautiful color all over here. Gonna leave the oven door open. We're gonna turn it down to 200 in just a sec. These are our chimneys. I'm gonna poke these guys in. The reason I didn't put these in in the beginning is they will stick to the pastry and you'll have a difficult time getting them out um, once the pate is fully cooked. So these are uh, basically the ends of a uh, pastry nozzles. You can use um, foil, but these work fantastic. So we're gonna go back in, the oven's nice and coming down to temp now. And now we'll just keep an eye on it, but about 30 to 40 minutes, we'll check it. Can take anything up to an hour, depending on how the fast is. All right, we're gonna pull this guy out, take a temperature, see where we're at. Exactly around 146 degrees. Our aim was 145. I'll take 146. That's pretty much where I want to be here. It's gonna be slightly cooler down in the bottom. The top's gonna be slightly hotter, but right in the middle here, 
It's looking for 145 ish. So, right in the middle is where we want to be. And I'm very happy with this one. We're going to now start to fill it with aspic pretty quickly. Something to note here is the fat from the foie gras has uh, melted and started to rise up. As I pull these chimneys out, it's going to overflow slightly. And that's okay. A little tip that I like to do when using a pate that has got a high fat content in it like this, is to just squeeze some of this fat out. So I'm just gonna lift it gently and just do a little pour, just pouring out a little of the fat. Not too much, because the fat is the amazing flavor. And now we can see exactly where it needs to be. If we didn't pour aspic in at this stage, it's like a, a critical point in um, the finished product here. The meat is up here at the moment. By tomorrow morning without cooling it, it's gonna be down here and any little air gap, it, nothing's gonna get in there. The fat's gonna go down, solidify, and you're gonna get a very unpleasant looking pate going through it. The key now is to start adding hot liquid while this is still around 140-ish degrees, and it's gonna find its own way into all of those little holes. It's gonna continue to push the fat to the top, and we can continue to strain some of that fat off whilst adding more aspic into it. At the moment, the liquid is sitting at the very top of all of these holes. As this cools, the liquid's gonna shrink and we'll continue adding the aspic into it. That way we'll have an entire pate that should have zero air gaps in it and should be filled to the top with beautiful aspic. So this step will continue to happen another four or five times. Pate is finished. It's been sitting in the refrigerator overnight for about 18 hours now, we've got the remaining of our beautiful aspic, which is um, about 110-ish degrees. This is fully cold. We continued to fill it yesterday for another four or five times. You can see now, it's really heavy. It weighs about 15 pounds, one of these ones here. There's some holes up here, but aspic should be all the way up to the edges around here now. So we're gonna do one last fill with our lovely warm aspic over here. Really good sign is that when you pour it in one hole, it will start to come through the other holes. Beautiful color on this aspect, really good clarity to it. There's no fat in there. Okay, so uh, it's all finished now. Uh, aspic is completely up the top. It shouldn't be too many air gaps in here, hopefully, and I'm really looking forward to cutting into it in the next couple of hours, yeah? Pate is finished. We're now gonna take the mold off going to take a few minutes to do this. This is always the exciting part and the uh, slightly uh, nervous part. You put so much work into this, you definitely don't want to mess it up at this stage. Uh, we'll just go in and start with our blowtorch. We're just going to lightly warm the top up. I like to do this so it just brings it back to life. We pull out a pin, another pin, and then the first thing we're going to do is lift it up here and start warming the bottom through. The bottom is done first because it holds in the two sides. If you, if you go to take the sides off, you're, you won't get very far. So gently warming the bottom, drop it down, peel it out. The bottom is looking exactly like we want the bottom to look. So now we'll drop it gently here, gently down the sides. This side's loose, so I'm going to flip it around at this stage and start working the other side. Notice I'm doing it on a, not doing it directly on the table. Warming all the sides up. Coming back around here now. This side's nice and loose. Coming off. Coming in. Gently pulling the edges off. This is our Amazing uh, pate on croute takes uh, a week to make. Yeah, this is a this is a good one. It's turned out really well. So, what is this like? 82 ingredients, 20 master chef techniques, and two days later, we're ready to try it. This is the finished pate on croute. Um, things I'm looking for here are crispy pastry on the top and the bottom. Nice and crisp on the sides, but having a slightly different texture. I like a tiny bit of chew on the pastry there. Aspic is looking clear, dark and clear, which is always a good sign. And obviously the fast in the middle is gonna be uh, hopefully nice and mosaic. 
cool. You know, I've probably only ever made maybe like six of these in my life. Oh yeah. Probably three or four in culinary school and in this butcher shop in Paris I worked at and we did a couple of them. I make about six a week for the last four years. So if I can't get it right now, I never can. Ready? Ooh, that oh. looks yummy. I've been speaking about mosaic the whole time while I'm here, and this is exactly what I'm looking for. You know, we've got our pistachios and pork shoulder down here. We've got our boudinoir, which is cooked perfectly, and lovely prunes steeped in calvados, foie gras, and then more of the same farce at the top. You can see really, really key thing here is that there's no air gaps anywhere. This is like a perfectly made pate here. The aspic has got down to the bottom. This is uh, a technique that you only get by pouring in the aspic when the pate is hot. Otherwise, you'll just end up with air gaps. On the top? Yeah. Aspic on top, air in the bottom? Yeah, so it, it's got to find its way in all the way down to the bottom and almost make the pate float upwards. This is what yeah. I was talking about. Really crisp on the bottom, crisp on the top, and then slightly chewy on the edge. You know, you can just keep it going longer and get crisp all around, but for me, I like a little texture, so, you know, always having a little variance there, yeah? It looks simple on a plate, but when you know <laughs> how we've gone over, you know, yeah. seven days process to get here. Nice even slicing. Little salt on top, not too much. Mm. I mean, I would then just pick this guy up, put it on the plate here, take a nice spoon of mustard. Oh, yum. Plunk him down, and uh, you go. Plunk him down. Mm -hmm. I do yeah. want a chunk of foil, and I want a little bit of that sweet prune. Yeah. You should go for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing about classic charcuterie. Oh, yeah. The mm. salty, sweet, fat combo. Like the little prune in there, mm -hmm. the foie, the pork fat. Mm -hmm. And the crust is perfect. Mm -hmm. The texture is perfect on it. Taste the difference in the textures. You get the warming spices, you get the sweetness from the prune, you get the fat from the foie gras. Um, the pastry textures from being crisp on the bottom, just slightly chewy around the edges. The boudinoir giving it that really rich, irony flavor. I don't think I would, well, I wouldn't change anything about this, yeah. I love it. All right, the pate group takes a lot of work. It's probably the most steps of anything we will have on chef steps ever, which I know a lot of you really like. So for the folks who really like measuring and really like going through step by step, this is like an OCD person's fantasy. <laughs> it's gonna be on chef steps, <clears throat> every video, tips and tricks, plus some of your other recipes. Yeah, like Christmas pudding, the yeah. Yeah. All sorts, all sorts of goodies. And I hope we have more too coming soon. Love that. This is amazing. Bringing it back. Old school charcuterie with the Pate and Crew. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. Really fucking good, right? That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of a dish that has more variables that could go wrong with any one dish. Um, but it's <laughs> Perfect, try it this weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel and visit chefsteps.com for more tips, recipes, guides, and tools to help you level up in the kitchen.